In this house, there's almost no day quite as good as New Home Lab Parts Day. Well, almost. If you've ever thought about running your own servers for home or business use, but don't want to deal with the headaches of maintaining hardware, why not let Linode host your services for you? They make it simple to deploy and manage your own cloud infrastructure, with solutions ranging from a single shared CPU to massive multi-core virtual machines. You can even add in dedicated enterprise GPUs for machine learning. With shared CPU plans starting at as little as $5 per month and scaling up to as high as you need to go, you'll be able to find a hosting plan that fits your needs. They also have 24-7, 365 support available, regardless of your plan size. That's a better support plan than I have on my personal server rack, I can tell you that much. Visit linode.com slash craft computing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craft computing. And thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Don't worry, you'll see what these are for in a week or two. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. While the core of my home network is in pretty darn good shape, I always find myself wanting to upgrade just a little bit more, as is the circle of life with a lot of people's home labs. At the heart of my network is the Ubiquiti UDM Pro, or Unified Dream Machine. And while it is a fantastic firewall with very easy configuration and management tools, it doesn't make for the greatest core switch in the world due to it only having one inward-facing 10 gigabit port. Until today, I've been using that 10 gigabit port as a downlink to my Mikrotik CRS 328-24P. It's a fantastic 1U 24-port PoE Plus switch, as well as having four SFP Plus ports. It is a fully managed switch, meaning it can take all of the VLAN and routing configuration that you can throw at it. And at only 379 is a pretty darn good value for a home lab or even a small business installation. But with only four SFP Plus ports, it does feel a little bit limiting given my current server layout. So I figured why not throw some more 10 gig connectivity at my rack. Inside this box is the Mikrotik CRS317 1G 16 Plus RM. And as you can tell, it has 16 SFP Plus 10 gigabit ports on it. Inside the box, there's not much as far as accessories go. You obviously get the CRS317 itself, two rack ears for a standard 19 inch rack, as well as some rubber feet if you're just gonna put this onto a desk and a Mikrotik sticker. Interestingly enough, this did not come with a power cord. And I find that a little bit perplexing because this does have redundant power supplies on board, meaning you'll need to have at least two C15 plugs on board. Now, luckily, those are fairly standard power cables in the PC community, being as that's what you plug into any computer power supply or monitor you've ever purchased. But you will need to source those yourself. Now, when I bought the CRS328 that's in my rack right now, I knew eventually I would be adding a full 10 gigabit core switch like this. The main thing that I was after was the 24 ports of PoE Plus connectivity, so I could power up all of my access points and eventually some security and home automation products. The fact that it had four SFP Plus ports on it was actually more of a bonus, as it allowed me to get both PoE Plus connectivity as well as 10 gigabit and get up and running when I moved into my new house. But seeing as how my server farm has expanded to... 10? physical servers, uh, I'm obviously out of 10 gigabit links on the rack, especially when one of the links has to come here to my office for 10 gig to my desktop, and the other one is simply an uplink to my firewall. So if my firewall is a UDM Pro, why did I end up purchasing a Mikrotek switch for my top of rack rather than going with the Unify 16XG? Honestly, it comes down to price, as the CRS317 is only $380 versus the Unify 16XG, which will run you around $600. That's a pretty substantial cost increase just to integrate a switch into Unify Central Management, which I will say is a very nice feature to have, but I'm simply after line rate speed for all 16 ports, which both of these switches will provide. This one I just have to manage individually. Feature-wise, there's not a lot to tell here. There are obviously the 16 SFP Plus 10 gigabit ports. There's a single console port for serial access. There's also a single one gigabit port for ethernet or management of the switch. There's one other major advantage to the CRS317 versus the Unify 16XG, and that's, have you ever heard the fans on a 16XG? Because you'll hear that switch above the rest of your server rack, versus this switch is powered on right now. So without any further ado, what do you say we get this thing into the rack?
And as always, installing a new piece of equipment into the rack didn't go quite as smoothly as I would like, mainly because I had to lift just about every component on my rack up to you above where my servers are mounted. So it took me probably about an hour and a half to get everything shuffled around and cable managed and whatnot. But we are now mounted into the rack and the switch is up and running. Now the CRS317, like a lot of Mikrotik switches, can function in two different modes. One, they have the router OS, which is a router firewall style operating system. And then they have SWOS or switch OS, which is meant for internal LAN switching only. And that's what I'm booted into right now. Jumping on over to my UDM Pro, you can see that the CRS317 has been given an IP address of 10.0.0.246, but I do want to give this a static reservation. So I'm going to click on that, go over to configuration, I'm going to go down to network, and then say used a fixed IP address, and we're going to give this 10.0.0.2, and then somewhere behind my face, I'm going to hit apply. There we go. So we're gonna go ahead and jump over to the switch real quick. And by default, it will have admin as a username and there will be no password, so blank for a password. Uh, we are currently on the old IP address. I'm gonna go ahead and give this thing a reboot really quick so we can grab the new uh, static assigned address. And of course, that's behind my face again. So I'm gonna drag that over here. <laughs> And now you can see that we have a reboot option. Also down in the system tab, you have the boot router OS. That's if you wanted to use this as, like I said, a router or a firewall. But we're just gonna reboot this real quick and hopefully it'll grab the new IP. All right, 10.0.0.2. I'm gonna type in admin for the username and no password. First thing you should always do when logging into a switch for the first time is set a password that's better than admin and blank. So we're gonna go ahead and do that now. Uh. I hate interfaces where they use literally every bit of the screen because it makes it really difficult to place my face on the screen and record it all in one session rather than trying to superimpose it and sync up the clips later. Now that my face is out of the way again, we're gonna go down to password change. Old password is obviously nothing. And I'm gonna change this to a password that, well, you all don't know. And if everything looks good, go ahead and click on change password. It should ask for your new password. So go ahead and type that in and go ahead and click on okay. I'm going to go ahead and walk through a couple quick VLAN configurations, mainly to see if I can get my home lab back up and running today and make sure the IP addresses are actually being served properly. And then later tonight, after the family goes to bed, I'll probably swap out the rest of the cables. That way, Plex never goes down for them. So I'm going to jump back over to the web GUI here and then click on the SFP tab. And you can see all of the ports that I plugged in SFP plus DAC cables to, and we can go ahead and start configuring those ports. And yes, I know DAC cable is a little redundant. The first ports we're going to look at are 9 10, 11, and 12, and those are going to be connected to my home lab servers, three of them to the hypervisors and one of them to my home lab NAS box. So we're going to go over to the VLANs tab, and I'm going to move my face again. There we go. Sorry. Then we're going to click on append so we can add a new VLAN. I'm going to add VLAN 1010, which is my home lab VLAN. And for membership, I'm going to uncheck all of the boxes except for 9, 10, 11, 12, 16, and 17. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then 16 and 17 are both going to stay up right now because 16 is the SFP Plus port that will be connected up to the Unify UDM Pro, and then 17 is actually the 10 gig port that is currently connected to the UDM Pro because, again, I can't switch over everything while the family's awake. And I really wish they had a better way of assigning group members other than hovering over the box and waiting for the port number to pop up. Like, can't you just give me a checkbox with the port names above them? And if everything looks good, go ahead and hit apply all. And while I'm in here, I'm gonna go ahead and add the other VLANs so they are set up and reserved, starting with VLAN 1000 for my servers. And yes, I know that VLAN 1000 is reserved for whatever ancient tech. Uh, I'm never gonna plug that into my home network, so I don't care. And for right now, we're just gonna dial these all the way down to ports 16 and 17 only. 1001, and that is for my IoT devices. And finally, 1002 for my client VLAN, and apply. Next up, I'm gonna go over to the VLAN tab, not the VLANs tab, which is where we just were. And this is where I actually define which ports are assigned to which VLAN or are tagged versus untagged. So for nine, I'm gonna hit enable, same with 10, 11, and 12. 
I'm gonna go over to default VLAN ID and I'm gonna set this as 1010. So any clients plugged into ports 9, 10, 11, or 12 will now be in the 1010 or the home lab VLAN that I have set up. I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my home lab servers and make sure that they actually come up on that specified VLAN. All right, and I think we can call this a success. Uh, jumping back over to my UDM Pro, you can see my home lab TrueNAS box right there did get a home lab address of 10.10.0.34. Uh, again, I'm probably gonna sign that with a uh, static reservation here before too long. And I couldn't get the other two home lab servers booted up because they currently have Proxmox installed and Proxmox hates switching VLANs and they were still set to my old VLAN configuration. So I'm just gonna wipe those and probably reinstall anyway. But that's the whole purpose of having a home lab. So that is a very quick overview of the Microtech CRS317 1G16SRM. And yes, I did remember that name off the top of my head and I sure hope it was right. Anyway, if you have any questions or comments about this video, feel free to leave them down below. On your way down there, you can check out the Amazon affiliate links I have where you can buy this switch for yourself. And don't forget to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Floatplane. Links are both down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today was sent over by a longtime fan of the show, John, from all the way out in Rhode Island. This is the Gray Sail Brewing Captain's Daughter Double IPA. I love when you crack an IPA and you can smell it from halfway across the room. You can't help but be tempted by our captain's daughter. Her full body, her exotic bouquet, brewed with mosaic hops, her allure is as fresh as it is intriguing. Yet she commands respect. Try to take advantage of her and she'll put you in your place. We raised our daughter well. I could not agree more as the father of two daughters. That's what I like to see out of an IPA head. <laughs> I will say the nose on this one is very interesting. And it's interesting in that it's, it's more floral than citrusy, but both of those are very present. And uh, seeing as how this is only using mosaic hops, I don't know, I expected something a little bit different. Her full body, her exotic bouquet. It's definitely all that. Uh, it's definitely a, a thicker, chewier, clingier style IPA. There's a lot of residual hop oils that, that really bite onto your tongue and don't let go. Uh, it leaves you with a, a, better, a very bitter and drying taste uh, that some people love on IPAs and some people, they despise IPAs for that specific reason. Myself, I love that flavor. Yeah, definitely more of a floral style IPA, which is uh, honestly a pretty nice departure from some of the more recent big and bold citrusy IPAs. Kinda takes me back a couple of years. It's a good one.